Well, welcome to this session on climate change. And we're very fortunate. We have uh, a number of very knowledgeable people up here, and uh, it's very timely because, as you all know, uh, we are at uh, five minutes to midnight in terms of being able to take the necessary action to address the issue of global warming. And uh, the Paris conference in December is seen as a major, major, and perhaps last effort to get a global agreement a binding global agreement that will be enforceable. And I think you're going to find that there are many issues associated with climate change. Um, and uh, we'll have hear from that, some of our panelists, on that subject as well. But of course, everybody is saying, well, we have to keep emissions, uh, especially of CO2, which is the worst of the, it's not the worst of the greenhouse gas emissions, but it stays in the atmosphere for as much as a century or longer, and therefore it's a cumulative effect. Granger Morgan at Carnegie uses the analogy of a, of a bathtub with a very big faucet and a very small drain. And that's why we constantly see increases in the accumulations, which now, the last numbers I looked at, probably exceed 400 parts per million, and the threshold that everyone talks about is 450. That seems to be the, the consensus of the International Panel on Climate Change. Uh, which is you know, a group of international scientists who have come up with that, but some, such as Jim Hansen, the American climatologist and scientist, highly respected, says, no, it should be a 350 uh, in order to prevent global warming and all the consequences, including rising sea levels, weather aberrations, drought, famine, um, tropical diseases moving north, and so on. I'm not going to tell you all of those things now, but I just want to give you some sense of the, what is seen as the importance of um, the meetings in Paris in December. Some of us, I being one, are a bit skeptical that we're going to be able to attain those objectives, even if they're agreed upon, since we have a record going back to 1972 at least, of, uh, you know, of not being able to do so. The Stockholm Conference in 72, then of course uh, followed by Our Common Future by Gro Harlem Brundtland in 89, then Rio in 92, then UNGAS in 97, Kyoto in 97, uh, Copenhagen, and we still have not been able to turn the corner and get these emissions on the downward path. So we have panelists today, Eugenia Kalne, who's a distinguished university professor, uh, professor at the University of Maryland. I won't give them all the CVs, it just takes time. You probably have them in your book. So with that, I turn the floor over to you. And I don't need to convince you about climate change, you know, you know all this, the, this is how the mean temperature has evolved, how the atmospheric carbon dioxide measured at, at Mauna Loa has been evolving with the annual cycle and the con, the, which we are already past 409, 400 uh, units. And another example is uh, the the IPCC had predicted that the sea ice would melt in the Arctic, but they, it had predicted that it would reach the current uh, level that we have reached in, 19, in 2065, but it's already reached it in 2010. So things are going much faster than projected. So what has caused this explosion of carbon emission? The, the carbon emission is, is due to the explosion in the size of the human system. Uh, before, uh, the, for hundreds of thousands of years, the, the total population was less than, than 10, million, 10 million. But it, uh, after the agri uh, agriculture started, it took a whole, uh, uh, it took until 1800 to, to reach 1 billion. And after that, it took only one century to reach 2 billion. And, and then in the, last, in, in the last century, 5 billion more humans were added. So this is an incredibly uh, fast exponential growth. And uh, when when we look at the total impact, it's the population times the GDP per capita. 
And the GDP per capita also grew very fast, especially after the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and in 1800. And, and the, the total impact is the product of the population and the GDP per capita. So this is a, a, a super exponential growth of, of, of our consumption. And how much of that is due to the increase in the GDP per capita and, and the increase in population. Well, basically, since 1950, we have that it's about half and half, two, about 2% two is due to increase in population, 2% in, in GDP per capita. So uh, it, it, uh, that, that, that indicates that population and consumption are both important. And uh, conventional wisdom is that that population growth is no longer a problem because the rate of growth is going down. But actually, if you look at the absolute terms of the annual population increase, and this is in millions, and this is 1950, 45 millions, if you look, it's been essentially constant for for uh, the since uh, for the last 30 40 years and and we are adding to to the population of the world about 80 more than 80 million per per year and this is like adding the population of one germany every year and uh, the, the after that uh, we from that we get one New billion every 12 years, and the, uh, the, it's expected that the, this uh, one billion every 12 to 15 years will continue. And what what made this possible? How could we explode so much? And and it started with the industrial revolution, with the rapid uh, exploitation of fossil fuels, which is a huge stock of carbon that nature accumulated over hundreds of millions of years and it's consumed in just two or three centuries and so the the carbon is being released at a rate of which is a million times the rate nature accumulated it and it was this access to to the huge stock of fossil uh, fossil uh, uh, that enable the population explosion through through higher levels of food materials and energy, but uh, reducing population growth is not discussed in any of the of the <laughs> Copenhagen or or Paris meetings as part of the solution of the uh, to climate change. Reducing population growth is one of our most powerful tools to to reduce future growth in emission. Because again, total emissions is populations times emissions per capita. So we, we discuss a lot about emissions per capita, but we don't discuss population uh, because it's a taboo subject. So implementing family planning is a low cost and effective policy tool, which should be part of the solution to reduce carbon emissions. So uh, uh, per dollar spent, family planning reduces four times as much carbon over the next 40 years as adopting low carbon technologies, as a, a, as a paper showed. So in, in summary, climate change is happening at a very rapid pace, pace. Total emissions is the product of population and emission per capita. Population is still growing at record levels. It's growing faster now than than it ever did before. The, and the current UN median projection for 2100 is of 11 billion. And it's, it's also projected to continue growing, even though before it, it was assumed to, to, to reduce uh, in, after 2050. In the discussion about how to reduce future emissions, reducing future population growth is, 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 is ignored. So implementing family planning uh, is a low cost and effective policy tool which should be part of the solution to re reduce carbon emissions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eugenia.
the World Knowledge Forum.